I can, and I see everybody. Same. Uh, I hear I you. I see I you. See you. I can I, hear you. Oh, it's recording. Okay, good. All right. I'm sorry. Because uh, I hit the record button, then everybody disappeared for a couple of seconds. So I'm going to share the screen. I, I should start over, but that's all right. Thank God for everything. You know, we're here and uh, we're going to study uh, biblical word study. Uh, one word at a time, one verse at a time until we get it. And uh, we're never going to get it. So we're just going to keep studying anyway. But thank you, God, for everything. And here we are. Today we're doing... Uh, a little bit of Gog and Magog, and we know what that is. Uh, if we don't, uh, we'll get into it. So uh, this is the, the McClinic and Strong. I'm not going to get into this right now, but I got uh, <clears throat> a few things. <laughs> As you can see, I got a few things lined up here, uh, a few pages, um, and we'll go uh, with, um, I think we'll start with the theological word book here. And we'll do that first um, on this here with Gog. <clears throat> Gog and Magog. Uh, let me get another page here. It's this way, be, uh, the whole page will be taken up. This way we can read it and, uh, and follow along. Was that 1463? Hey, I'm betting pretty good here. All right. Now it will be TWOT 324. If you want to follow along here in the theological word book of the Old Testament. So Gog, <clears throat> actually what it means uh, is is mountain, you know, uh, and and also in the uh, in the Greek in the New Testament, it also means mountain uh, or it's, it's the king, actually the king of the land of Magog, uh, who will come uh, from the north and attack the land of Israel, among other things. The, it's, it's the name of a Reubenite and a few other things. So this, uh, <clears throat> and you'll see it a lot in Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39, and uh, Magog would be uh, the land, um, well, I have the number for that. Let me get Magog is, um, <clears throat> let me get the number for that. Magog is 4031. There we go. There we go. So we'll look him up real quick here. Magog, uh, land of Gog. So Gog is the, the ruler and uh, uh, May is, is the Magog is, is the land of Gog. And it's four times in the uh, in the Bible. And in the New Testament, it means overtopping or covering. It's the land north of Israel fr from which the king of Gog will come to attack Israel. So that's basically the, uh, the gist of that. <clears throat> And uh, we'll get into some of these verses uh, related to that, uh, and we'll find out a little bit more about that when we read Ezekiel. So uh, Ezekiel envisions this prince as a leader of a vast horde of armed troops that includes people from Persia, Kush, Put, Goma, and uh, Bethel Gar Garma. Uh, and if you look at you know the Table of Nations in, in Genesis 10, you'll see all of these names. And we might slip into that uh, in a little bit, but let me just do this first. <clears throat> uh, they will march against Israel at a time when the people of God have returned to their land and live in peace completely undefended. Uh, but this will all be allowed by the Lord that he might display his holiness among them. Uh, the people of God will not have to fight for God himself will destroy these armies of Gog. And you'll see that in uh, Ezekiel 38, uh, 19 to 23. Uh, we'll read that. He says, for in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there will be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heavens and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. And all these, you know, the mountains of cities and things like that and walls and, and, and you know, that waters and floods are people and things like that. So we know the idioms here. We know the metaphors. And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, and every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead him 
uh, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the, the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones and fire and brimstone. This, uh, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And this is when Gog attacks. And you also see that in Revelation uh, 20 and 7 and 9. So what, what, some people say that this is that was the literal uh, happening that will happen literally. And I don't know that. Uh, we don't know that. But this most uh, uh, most likely here is, is the spiritual aspect of this when you read Revelation in uh, 20 uh, and 7. I mean, we, we could set it up a little better, but I just want to read this anyway. Uh, and, and when the thousand years are expired, and we know what thousand years is, that's to kill you, and it's at least 2,000 years, uh, Satan will be loosed out of his prison, and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, and we'll understand when we get into the table of nations what, are, what all these people are, to gather them together to, to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Uh, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. What's that? That's that's Jerusalem. And fire came down from heaven, uh, from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's the same thing we just read in uh, in the literal, in the, or it could be the literal in in Ezekiel 38. So these go together, Ezekiel and uh, this this uh, sentence here in uh, Revelation. So it, it places this event after the thousand years are over, and. This is this would not be like after the thousand the Kilia. This would be like sometime in the Kilia, and when Satan will be released to deceive the nations, Gog and Magog, and mobilize them uh, for war. Uh, so, and all attempts to trace the name, the origin of the name of of Gog, must be held to be tentative. And when you see, uh, I read a little bit in uh, Clinic is Wrong about Gog, and Jim always explains it as Gol, uh, the Caucasian, the Caucasus Mountains, and that's up there where it's at. And 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 they just hardened the the H instead of saying Gol, it's Gog. Uh, some of the names are, are Giggies of Lydia, who drove away the Cimmerians or the Chimerians, and that's Gomer. As you can see in, in, in some of these books that you read, uh, we know that Gomer is the Chimerians or the Chimerians. Others see it, uh, a name mentioned in Assyrian records, Gagul, and it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. So uh, it is not important theologically that we be able to trace the name linguistically or identify it historically. Most uh, Christians interpret these passages as eschatologically, and we know that eschatologically is end time uh, prophecy. Uh, precise interpretations differ. Some see the passage as highly symbolic of the final struggle between the church and the forces of evil. And that it is. Uh, others take it quite literally, uh, say that the nation of Israel will be attacked after the millennium or the Kilia when Satan is released only to be finally destroyed by being cast into the lake of fire. And that's also symbolically, too, and it could be literal. I mean, uh, you can see uh, Israel has been attacked in the past by every nation over there. Uh, but now they're they're saying that this will happen. It'll be a simultaneous attack, especially from the the Gog and Magog section up there in the north. Uh, you're talking, you know, Russia and, and and Armenia and all of those places up there by the Black Sea. Uh, besides all of the the people they've had to deal with all, all these years uh, in the uh, in the Arab nations. So uh, others consider the references in Revelation 20, 7 and 9 to be illusions, not decisive, decisive as to the time of fulfillment. And they identify the time of fulfillment as the Battle of Armageddon before the millennium. And we can get into Armageddon. We'll get into all of this stuff. So uh, Magog, it's used in uh, uh, Ezekiel 32 and 2. It's not 32 and 2, actually. Uh, it's... Uh, 38 and 2, so that's a misprint here, and 39 and 6, so it's not 32 and 2, uh, it's um, 38 and 2, let me look real quick just to make sure, 38, 2, and 39, 6, yeah, 38, 2, son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of uh, of Meshach and Tubal and, and prophesy against him. And 39 and 6, 
and I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. And that's the isles. That's all the G Gentiles up there in the north. And they shall know that I am the Lord. So there's Gog and Magog there. Uh, and then Revelation 20 and 8 is is this eschatological sense. So you can you can look at Ezekiel and look at Revelation 20 and, and match it up. However, in the Table of Nations in, in Genesis 10, uh, uh, Magog is the name of a nation that descended from Japheth. Uh, here, Magog has some connection with others related to Japheth, uh, such as Goma, uh, Medai, which is the Medes, Javan, which is the Ionians, which is the Greeks, uh, Tubal, Meshach, uh, you could say uh, that's up there in uh, like Armenia and, uh, and Russia, and Tiras, uh, and some of uh, whom are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, they are all people who live north of Israel, more or less, and who are of the non-Semitic origin. So they are uh, Gentiles. And then we co we come to um, we go to theological dictionary. Uh, theological dictionary. Uh, we look at uh, in volume one. Let me look at this. Uh, where am I? Theological dictionary. Uh, we'll look at one seven eighty nine, right? Seven eighty nine, and you can't read along here. I'll just read this. Uh, it's so in, in in the New Testament, this is the only place you're going to see uh, Gaga Mega right here uh, in in twenty eight and nine. Let me put this in here. Twenty eight and nine. Uh, and shall go out to all, uh, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, encompassed the camp of the saints round about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven, out of heaven, and devoured them. Uh, it, so uh, it's supposedly a, a mythical name for the heathen host, uh, which after the, the messianic period, of the millennial reign. See, when you read these guys here, um, they, they they put these words in here and they really don't know what they mean. So they're talking about after the messianic period. What, what's that? And the millennial reign. They, they think there's a literal thousand year reign on earth after this, and there isn't. We are now in the Kilia, and the Kilia started when, when, when Peter stood up and says, this is that, uh, what Joel was talking about. So for the past 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, we've been in this so-called millennial reign. So we, we reign as priests and kings. Uh, looks like my, uh, my thing is on here. I want to turn this off. There we go. There we go. Anyway. <clears throat> so uh, the, so the, it's talking about the final content, conflict uh, uh, against the people of God. And, and they will be destroyed by God uh, with fire. Uh, both the name and the whole idea are, are taken by the divine uh, from the prophecy of Ezekiel uh, in 38 and, and 39. And we'll saw, we saw that. Uh, the order uh, especially is taken from Ezekiel. Uh, and Ezekiel, we have the, the messianic reign. So in some sense, these guys have it right in some sense. Like if, we, if you're talking about Ezekiel 37, what's that talking about? That's talking about the, the, the Valley of Dry Bones, all right? And and when he puts puts them together, let me get my book here. Uh, the Vision of Dry Bones. Um, and he says, uh, let me see where he is. When he, when he puts them together, we can't read the whole thing. I don't want to read the whole thing. So, uh, and, but we know that this is like a, a resurrection. You could call this a resurrection. Uh, when the, when the, 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 the dry bones are put together, bone to bone, and, and they caused, uh, caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many open in the valley, and lo, they were very dry. Uh, and he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, and I said, Oh, Lord, thou, thou knowest. Uh, and he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So they come together, they put the sinews together, the bones come together, and they're all standing there, and they're still yet dead. There's no breath in them. So 
He says, uh, so I prophesied in seven and commanded as I was prophes prophesied. And there was a noise and behold, a shaking and the bones came together bone to bone. And then he talks about, uh, uh, can these live, uh, oh, breath uh, and, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Uh, so I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they stood and 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 lived and stood upon their feet and an exceeding great army. So this is the uh, the bone to bone. This is the, the the valley of dry bones. And this is the people. This is uh, Benjamin uh, and, and Judah coming together. I uh, put my spirit into them. And he says uh, in this part here, he says, moreover, uh, thou son of man, take thee one stick and write upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions, then take another stick and write upon it for Joseph. Uh, and that's Ephraim, the stick of Ephraim for all the house of Israel. So you're talking about the 10 northern tribes and the two southern tribes here, and he's going to put them together and join them one stick unto another stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. Uh, and, and that would happen in, um, let me see. I read this here. I got 17. Uh, we, we could say that's uh, May 14th, 1948, when they became uh, a nation like that. Um, so let me see. Open your graves, out of the graves, put my spirit in you, okay. Uh, and I will join them, one, and they shall become one in nine hand, and that would be 1948. And, and when the children of the people, thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, will thou not show us what thou meanest by these say unto them thus saith the lord behold i will take the stick of joseph which is in the hand of ephraim because he got the inheritance and the tribes of israel his fellows and i'll put them with even with the stick of judah and this is southern judah that's benjamin and judah and shall make them one stick so all 12 tribes will be one and they shall be in mine hand and today that's the whole nation of israel all 12 tribes there um let me see. I'll oh, we'll make them one nation um, uh, upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and, and they shall be no more two nations, neither they shall be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. And, and you could say this could be spiritual too, because we are spiritual Israel. Uh, neither shall they defy themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people. And I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. So if these people ever come to Christ, uh, this is what's going to happen. But if not, it's gonna, then it's us. And it's the scattered. It's the remnant scattered all over the world. And then in 38, so you can say that's that's like resurrection or that would be like the the, the, the messianic kingdom uh, that it talks about here in uh, in the theological dictionary. And then in, in 38, he talks about uh, the army of Gog and, and his evil attempts and what he's going to do. Uh, and, and we see um, um, all these nations here. Uh, we we can go back to uh, uh, Genesis 10 and, and look at these, uh, but that would take forever for this. But we we, we know what, where where these are from. Uh, when, when, if you look at Genesis 10 real quick, and you can see these in the, in the table of nations, and we can break it down uh, and and know exactly where these people are from uh, just by going to dictionaries and uh, and other books. All right. So we'll go and, and we'll look. I, I got them all written in my uh, in the margins of, of my book and the table of nations. I got I got uh, maps and, and everything which that shows where all of these people are. Uh, and I did a, a good study on it years ago. And you can see uh, where all of these things are. These are these are the the the, the, the descendants of Shem, Ham. And Japheth, uh, we know uh, Ham is the youngest son of Noah, Shem is the middle son, and Japheth is the eldest. And uh, Shem is the Shemitic people, that's the, the people that stayed in, in, the, in the Middle East there. Ham is, is the folks that went to, to the west and they went to Egypt and uh, Ethiopia and places like that. And Japheth is the family, they went up north. So when you hear about uh, Gog and Magog, you're talking about uh, Japheth and the Isles. So, and, and, and the sons of uh, Goma. And you can see this is uh, 
the eldest son of Japheth, the father of Ashkenaz, Rifba, to Gomer is supposed to be the progenitor of the early Cimmerians. I don't know if that's Cimmerians or Cimmerians who occupy the Tauric Kerasones, of which the name of Crimea is a relic, relic, and the seventh century they devastated the western part of Asia Minor. And you can look up and you can find out basically where these people are from. Uh, it means vanishing. Uh, and I looked up all of these different th names, what they mean, and uh, those are those are good things to look up to all the definitions. Um, uh, Crimea. So that area, you, we know basically where it's from. So thus the whole Celtic race may be regarded as descended from Goma when you look at the Celts and all of that stuff. And then you got Magog. Uh, let me get the big dictionary here. Uh, Ezekiel uses the word, the land of God. Josephus identifies the Magites with the Scythians, and we know the Scythians uh, from a, a resemblance between the names of Gog and Genes, the king of Lydia. Some have suggested that the Magog is Lydia. Others, however, urge that Magog is probably a, a variant of Gog. Uh, in the Apocalypse of John, Gog and Magog represents the, all the heathen opponents of Messiah. Uh, and see exactly with it and we can't through all of these i mean I, I went through all of these i found out where all of these are from and i can tell you real quick without looking them up uh japheth uh goma the north crimea the celtic descendants uh the galatians uh, uh sprung from goma uh magog is from the caspian sea to india that would be the caucasus uh ruled by gog in the north so that's gog and magog and then uh Medai, would be what the Medes, okay? Uh, Javon, of course, is the uh, Ionians, which is the uh, the Greeks, uh, and then you have uh, Tubal. Uh, Tubal, where I have oh, these are uh, southeast of the Black Sea, uh, Russia, and the South Caucasus. So that's Tubal. Uh, and Meshach, you can say Muscovites also, Moscow, between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, those are Meshach. And Tiras is the, the Thracians or the Goths. So, and we can go through all of these, but the, you, if but you look at the Table of Nations and you ever take the time down to look look up where all of these people came from, you know what it is talking about? The people are up north that are coming down uh, to attack Israel. Uh, uh, towards the end of time. Uh, it might be literal, uh, it might be spiritual, but uh, he wouldn't have all of these these lands here and, and say that they're going to attack if, if it's not going to happen. And I, I think it will happen uh, literally. And um, where was I with this? Uh, I was doing Ezekiel. So I got to call back with that here. And... Um, um, let me see. Uh, the order, especially, is taken from Ezekiel, and and and, and Ezekiel, you could say we have the, the that messianic rage that we had in uh, uh, when we read from uh, 37, uh, and then uh, 38 was was the uh, I got them written here. Hold on a second. 38. So. Uh, I was going to read something else here. I got off track, but there was something else I wanted to do here. Revelation. Let me get this out of here and start here. Uh, Revelation 20. Uh, Revelation 20. There's a lot to this. Um, and um, I wanted to get some kind of understanding of, of, of where these match up between Revelation and Ezekiel. Uh, so, and then I want to, uh, well, we, we know 20. I'm not going to read the whole thing here. Uh, we, we, we just went through this Gog and Magog here. And then, and then we, when you match this up with Ezekiel, uh, it kind of makes sense what he's talking about here. And um, uh, 38, we read, we read 37, we skimmed through it real quick. Uh, 38, um, um, we read uh, some of this, 
but I wanted to stop at uh, 39. So you see, see, this is this is them getting ready to attack, and then 39. Uh, he says, Thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and, and, and say, Thus saith the Lord, behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and leave but a sixth part of thee, and I will cause thee to come up from the north parts and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. You know, these come up from the north parts because anybody that comes to Israel is coming up because it's, it's, it's in a mountain, it's up. Uh, you have to go, if you're coming from the south, you're going up to Israel. If you're coming from the north, you're still going up to Israel. Uh, and I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand, and it will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. They shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands, and the people that is with thee. I will give thee unto the ravenous birds of every sort, and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Uh, thou shalt fall upon the orphan field, for I have spoken it, thus saith the Lord. And I will send a fire on Magog, and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And the seven, he says, I will make my holy mountain in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them pollute my holy name anymore. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, it is come and it is done, saith the Lord. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows and all the handstaves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years and they shall take no wood out of the field neither cut down any out of the forest for they shall burn the weapons with fire and they shall spoil those that spoil them and rob them that rob them uh, saith the lord that's that's hard to understand they're talking about burning fire for seven years uh and we know seven is the number of com completion so it's going to be burnt completely uh whether it's going to be for seven years who knows um and it shall come to pass in that day that I will give Gog a place there of, of graves in Israel and the valley of passengers on the east of the sea. So the valley of the passengers. The passengers is the bar to pass over, to go by, to pass over, to come to pass through on the east side. And it shall stop the noses of the passengers. So there's going to be a lot of dead people lying around, and you won't be able to stand the smell for all the death that you smell. And 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 there shall they bury Gog and his all his multitude, and they shall call it the Valley of Ham and Gog. And another word for that you could you could say is uh, Armageddon, uh, Ham and Gog, uh, a multitude of Gog, the name of the valley in which the slaughtered forces of Gog are to be buried. Uh, the Valley of the Passengers on the east of the sea. So it's Hamangog, the Valley of the Passengers. And, and in a lot of places, it's called the, the Valley of Decision. Uh, and I have all of these other places here that you can call it uh, uh, Jezreel, Ezdralyan, Megiddo, Hamageddon. So all of these are, are the same place, actually, when you get right down to it. In the valley of Hamangog, and seven months, there we go with the seven again, <coughs> shall the house of Israel be burying <coughs> of them that they may cleanse the land. Uh, and we, we, we talk about the valley of the passage, the valley of Hamangog, the multitude uh, of Gog. And, and when you look at uh, Revelation uh, 16, Revelation 16 and 16. 16 and 16 uh, and he gathered them together unto a place in the hebrew tongue called armageddon so this is also the same place armageddon armageddon uh harmageddon uh let me give you what this this means here armageddon uh the hill or the city of megiddo so all of these are connected megiddo uh Hamangog, uh, Armageddon, uh, Esdraelon is there, and all these places where uh, there have been a lot of battles, and, and it's talking about the future slaughter also. So the Revelation 16, 16 uh, is the scene of the struggle of, the, of the good and evil. Uh, here we go. Uh, the struggle of uh, good and evil is suggested by the battle plane of Esdraelon. So here you go again. Armageddon, Megiddo, 
ha- Haman Gog, uh, Esdraelon, Jezreel. Uh, these are all places where there were slaughters uh, and 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 victories. There were good good slaughters and and bad slaughters also, uh, where there was uh, uh, famous for two vi- great victories. Remember Barak over the Canaanites and Gideon over the Midianites. This this is where this this is the valley. This is where it was, and then the two slaughters, the two d- disasters, the deaths of Saul and Josiah. Uh, hence, in Revelation, a place of great slaughter, the scene of a terrible retribution upon the wicked, and the RSV translates the name Ha Megiddon or the hill. Uh, R is the city of Megiddo. So basically, that's what Armageddon is standing for there, and it's associated with uh, Megiddo. Oh, you know, many slaughters, many batteries, battles, and um. We can look at uh, judges uh, if you want to look at some of these here. Judges uh, five nineteen. Real quick, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna split spend time on all these battles because there was there was a lot of them, and you can look it up. You can back it up with with uh, uh, the kings came and fought then uh, fought the kings of of Canaan in uh, Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. Uh, and they took no money of gain. Uh, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Uh, the, and the river Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down the strength. Um, and this is this is in the same area. This is Megiddo. And then uh, First Kings uh, 4.12. 1 Kings 4.12. I don't know if this is... Uh, with this one. Uh, Bayana, the son of Ahilud, to to him pertained Tanakh and Megiddo and all Beth Shean, which is by Zar, Zartana, uh, beneath Jezreel, uh, from Beth Shean to Ab- Abel uh, Mehola, even unto the place that is beyond Jachniam. Uh, so, and then there's uh, Second Kings. So all these places are connected, and they're all around each other, and it's where there was a lot of slaughter. Second Kings 23, 2 Kings 23, 29 to 30. Uh, in the days of uh, Pharaoh Necho, uh, king of Egypt, went up against the king of Assyria uh, to the river Euphrates. The king Josiah went against him, and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him. Uh, and his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him uh, to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher. And uh, this is when he went up against uh, the, the king of Egypt. Uh, the, the king of Egypt says, I got no problem with you. Get away from me. And he wouldn't listen. And the king of Egypt killed him. So, And this is these are the places where there was a slaughter. So the mountains of slaughter, they're called also. Uh, and let me get to... Uh, I could shoot over to this one, uh, 468, uh, but I wanted to get, give me 468, and and look at uh, Armageddon real quick. I wanted to just look at Armageddon, and that was 16, 16, um, 16, 16. Uh, and that would be in... Uh, Theological Dictionary 1, so we got the same book, uh, page 468. Uh, we'll look at that real quick here. Uh, uh, Mount um, Megadon uh, is a Hebrew name for the place where the kings of the whole earth. Uh, and you go back to 14. He says, uh, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, and like we always know that you know when you're talking about these these books in Revelation, they're not in chronological order. They're not in sequence. It's like Jim says. It's the, we're looking at the same picture from different angles. So this is the great day of uh, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What's that? That's Armageddon. And it's the same thing that's in Ezekiel, and it's the same thing that's in Revelation 20. It's the end of time. The end of time is in ten different books. Uh, in, in Revelation, and I'm just looking at it from a different angle. So, uh, like I said, uh, the books of Revelation are not in chronologic, chronological order. So, so they will uh, assemble under the direction of uh, dynamic uh, spirits 
in 13 for the final battle. Uh, it is thus the mountain of the world, which as the place of assembly of hostile forces is the counterpart of the mountains of God. And the mountains of God are in Hebrews, Hebrews 22, Hebrews what? No, Hebrews 12, 12, 22. These are the mountains of God. So, you, get, you know, we're talking about the two mountains. But you are come unto the Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood, the blood of sprinkling, that uh, speaketh better things than that of Abel. There's a whole mouthful in there, and that's the battle, and that's this is the, 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 the mountain. So, you know, we have the, the Jerusalem, uh, which is our mother, that's the mountain, and, and you also you have uh, Babylon, which is another mother, which is another mountain. So who's your mother? Uh, it is also uh, the place of the decisive battle. Uh, Revelation 16, 14, like I said, uh, it's it's all over. Uh, the, 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 the day of God, the, the battle of the great day of the God Almighty, and this is also in Revelation 19 uh, and 19. He says, and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. <laughs> you think this is a different battle? No, it's the same thing. Okay, and consequently, the judgment of the world and and the beast was taken uh, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image these both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh oh boy we'll get into that uh, the, the retention of the Hebrew and the failure to give an interpretation are part of this. There. Okay, and then uh, that's 19, Revelation 19, 17 to 21. I read that. I want to get into this other thing. Um, the riddle of Armageddon still awaits solution. So we're waiting for that to, to come to pass there. So um, uh, the great battle. I just want to, so the equate, um, Ezekiel 37 with uh, Re Revelation 20. We saw that already. Uh, Ezekiel 37 with Revelation 20. So you're talking about the Valley of Dry Bones, and then this this one here uh, talking about the the resurrection here, and then um, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39 with the Great Battle. You can equate that with uh, this here. So the, the, the Valley of Dry Bones would be here, with Revelation 24 to 6. Okay, and then in Revelation 7, talking about the, the Kilia being expired and uh, Satan being loosed out of his prison. Uh, so from 7 to 10, uh, they'll go out and deceive the nations, and the devil that deceived them would cast into the lake of fire and brimstone with a beast and a false prophet on, which we just read in Revelation 13, uh, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Uh, that's seven to ten. So that would be uh, you can you can match that up with what you read in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And then when you get down to uh, seven to ten, and then uh, the white throne, uh, him that sat on the stand before another book was opened. Uh, those, uh, yeah, you could also equate this with uh, with 38 and 39, uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39. But then when you're talking about, um, like w when you see uh, Ezekiel uh, 40, jumping around here a lot, but when you see 40, this is where he starts measuring out the temple. So uh, all of these these passages, all these these chapters after this, t talking about measurements and the, and the, what the what the you talking about the new creation. You're talking about New Jerusalem, uh, and this happens in the in the 25th uh, in the five and twentieth year of our captivity in the beginning of the year. And 
you got to understand that when he when he says in the five uh, and twenty fifth year in our captivity, Ezekiel always starts um, uh, a prophecy with with some of these these uh, these dates when he's talking about the twenty fifth year of our captivity, the tenth year of our captivity, the fifth year of our captivity. You got to understand when he was in captivity, and he was in captivity in in five. Like 597, he went in, and 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 586 was the total destruction of Jerusalem. So he's he's in there, you know, uh, a, a, lo a lot of years before the, the the the. So he's taken in 597. So if he says the five and twentieth year of his captivity, that will be what? That would be 572. 72, 71, 70, 69, 68. So he's just like four years. Before the the end of, of 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 when Babylon goes in and destroys Jerusalem, so this is even before that, uh, the tenth day of the month at the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, in the self same day, uh, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and brought me thither. So this is five seventy two uh, B C, and so uh, when you're talking uh, fourteen years. When he says, in the fourteenth year after the city was smitten, so five eighty six B.C. it was it was take, taken, and and you 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 minus uh, fourteen years from that, that's five seventy two. So we we know what he's talking about here, uh, that year. And this this he goes on to explain all of the dimensions in the uh, in the New Jerusalem, so to speak, and you'll see that in. Uh, in this uh, Revelation 21, you can equate with starting with uh, Ezekiel 40. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And you can go on there with that. So that's New Jerusalem. Uh, and we were talking about um, uh, there was a lot of different things here. I don't know where to go with this. Um, let me finish. Did I finish up this thing here with the uh, um, uh, there was one characteristic. This is in the theological dictionary about Gog and Magog. Uh, it says there is one characteristic difference between Revelation 20 and 8. Hold on, let me get there. Uh, Revelation 20 and 8. And uh, Ezekiel 38. So you, you can match these up. Uh, they shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. Uh, for, for all these uh, descriptions here, uh, it's it's offering real prophecy. So he he's referring to future historical events, and this is future. In Revelation 28, however, the whole conception, he says it's mythical, but it's not. He says uh, prophecy has become uh, the apocalyptic. So thus Ezekiel gives precise names to the princes, peoples, and kingdoms which make this attack on the people of God. He makes a more or less clear geographical and political identification. So it has to be real, though. Even even when he describes the destruction of the invaders in the land of Israel, he mentions the place and gives a detailed account. In Revelation 20 and 8, however, the armies come up from the four corners of the earth. So hand in hand with this, there is an altered understanding of the names. In Ezekiel, Gog is the prince who leads the invaders and Magog, the territorial name. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, Gog is a personal name and Magog, that of the people or of the land in which he dwells. And you can see that in a lot of different places. Uh, First Chronicles and Genesis 10-2, the Table of Nations. So in Revelation 20 and 8, however, the, the two very similar names are brought together, as he says, as a mythical double name uh, for the hostile host. And this name still has a sinister ring for the receptive leader. And we know that uh, Gog and Magog is that. And, and Gog is the leader and Magog is the land. Let me wrap that. And uh, did we finish this one? Yes, we did that one. Let me get that out of the way. Let me get that out of the way. And we read that. We read that. Uh, we can't go through Ezekiel. I mean, there's three, 
three or four chapters there. We can't read the whole thing, but you, you get what I'm talking about. And and the great battle was this great battle here. Let's talk about the great battle here a little bit. Uh, great battle. We eat flesh and drink blood, the fowls of the air, uh, supper of the great God. Uh, we're we're going to see this. It's all through the Bible. Uh, even even not in uh, eschatology, but uh, even in the Old Testament, when he talks about eating flesh and drinking blood, and you'll see that too, uh, and we know that it's a, it's a spiritual spiritual thing also. But um, in Revelation uh, 19, Revelation 19, is it 17 or 27? I think it's 17. Yeah, it's 17. Revelation 19, 17. He says, and I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And we read this. And the beast was taken, the false prophet. And this is this is the end of time when when he, he would take over. But you see these 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 armies, these battles, and 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 when he's talking about eating flesh, and we know to eat flesh and, and drink blood, it's it's a slaughter. It's what it means. And we'll get into that when we're talking about Jesus also, eating flesh and drinking blood. Uh, for uh, Revelation 16, 14, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And this is the same battle. And this is the same same thing. And you'll see it in, uh, in Joel. Go back to Joel here. Uh, three... Eleven to fourteen. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause the mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for the wickedness. Their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. You can see this in, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. I mean, you, you read about Jehoshaphat. It was a great king, but he had a few problems. But uh, he did good. And there was a, <laughs> there was a lot of uh, violence there in the valley. They call it the valley of Jehoshaphat. Um I, I did a little study on it. I don't want to go crazy on that. I took a little side trip and, and studied up on Jehoshaphat. He's a great king. Um, and also, um, what was I looking at? The Battle of the Great Day, the 14, and the Valley of Decision. So these are all symbolic uh, and synonymous phrases. Uh, Esdralion, Jezreel, Megiddo, Armageddon, Armageddo, uh, the Valley of Decision, and I, 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 w I wouldn't say so much the Valley of Jehoshaphat, but uh, it's there. It's up there. And uh, Isaiah uh, 56 and 9, uh, 56 and 9, he says, All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind, they are ignorant, they are all dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. And, you know, it's not only uh, the enemies of God, but uh, he, he also slaughtered his own, his own people uh, because they were uh, disobedient, you know. And I think there's a few verses I have on that uh, where he, he slaughters his, uh, the believers. Uh, because they uh, they went astray, uh, but this is um, more uh, great day battle of the great day is uh, Ezekiel thirty nine uh, and seventeen. We might have read it already, but I'll read it again. Thirty nine and seventeen. He says, and thou 
Son of man, thus saith the Lord God, speak unto every feathered fowl and to every beast of the field. Assemble yourselves together uh, on every side to my sacrifice, that I do sacrifice for you, even a great sacrifice upon the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of princes uh, of the earth of rams, lambs, and goats, bullocks, and all the fatlings of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you be full and drink blood till you be drunken of my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. Thus you shall be filled at my table with horses and chariots, with mighty men, and with all men of war, saith the Lord God. <coughs> so, uh, you know, we're not supposed to uh, uh, drink blood, eat blood, and that's forbidden. So we know this is metaphorical language here. So uh, the great day of God Almighty, um, we read that um, 20 and 8. Did I see 20 and 8? I think, yeah, we did 20 and 8. Um, and that's 20 and 8 is spiritual of Ezekiel 38 and 2. I think I covered that. 20 and 8 is Ezekiel. Okay, okay. Uh, Ezekiel 39, 17, we read that. And then Revelation 19, 18, I'm sure we read. I just want to touch on it real quick. Revelation uh, 19 and 18. Uh, it, yes, they eat the flesh of kings, flesh of captains. We read that. Okay. And so eat flesh and drink blood. We, we know it's it's an idiom uh, and it means to, to undergo a, a slaughter. Uh, and when you go to uh, John, John uh, 6, 53, where am I? John 6, 53, 53, he says, Then Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What's he talking about? For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. So they, the, the Roman Catholics took this and they ran with it, you know, and they just totally twisted it. Uh, as the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Uh, these things he said in the synagogue, and he taught in Capernaum. So like I said, eat, eat flesh and drink blood is an idiom, and, and Christ wasn't talking about the crackers and grape juice here. Uh, he was talking about uh, studying and reading and, and fellowshipping and and undergoing a death. Uh, so, you know, uh, when he says, uh, take this and eat this, he, he was talking about the book. He said, it's going to be sweet in your mouth. It's going to be bitter in your, in your, in your, in, in your bones, in your, in your, in your belly. So, it's, so we're eating the flesh and, and drinking the blood is to undergo a slaughter. When we go out and preach and people uh, call us crazy, that's, there's your drinking blood there. So um, went to slaughter, and and God caused uh, Israel to eat the flesh of their children. <laughs> I'm not going to go crazy with that, but there's a bunch of verses, uh, Leviticus uh, 26, 29, and we're not supposed to eat blood. Right? It's against the law. Leviticus 26, 29. Just let me uh, gross you out a little bit, you know, 26, 29. And you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. I will destroy your high places, cut down your images, cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols, and my soul shall abhor you. And he'll do that, and he did that. And in Jeremiah, you, you'll see that also. Jeremiah, where he did it. And there's so many verses. I'm not going to go through all. I'm just going to give you these two here. Jeremiah 19 and 9. Uh, that's how angry God gets. And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat every one of the flesh of his friend in the siege and straightness wherewith their enemies, and they 
shall seek their lives and shall straighten them. So that's what's going to happen when the, uh, in the siege. And who knows uh, what we'll do in, in a siege, you know? Uh, so we know that uh, literally drinking uh, blood uh, was prohibited uh, by the law. So it's, it's, it's used metaphorically um, just as, um, let me see, numbers 23, 24. So since, since we can't eat flesh uh, with the blood, we know that it was against the law. Numbers 23 and 24. 24 said, behold, um, let me see, the, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift up himself as a young lion. Uh, he shall not lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. Let's see what for reference to here. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath as it were the strength of a unicorn. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob. There neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What had God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion and lift himself up as a young lion. He shall not lie down until he eat the prey and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, neither curse ye them, nor bless them at all. So this is what uh, uh, Balaam was the seer, and he was given a, uh, a prophecy of, of what uh, Jacob will do in, in the future. But this, uh, so that's, this is the metaphorical use of, of eating prey and drinking blood. Uh, so, and then in First Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles, uh, 11 and 19 because we can't drink blood it's against the law uh, and, and said my God forbid it and this was uh, David that I should do this thing shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy now what's he talking about for for with the jeopardy of their lives they brought it therefore he would not drink it these things did these three mightiest when he said when he said oh if i can just have some water from this uh where is it he says uh oh that one would give me drink of the water of the well of bethlehem this is that is at the gate so these three mighty men broke through the, the went through the whole crowd of the enemy got this drink for david brought it back to him and he says and he calls it drink the blood of these men so it's it's metaphorical, and he poured the water out just like we pour the blood out too on on the ground, and then uh, Psalms. So it's metaphorical. Psalms fifty. Psalms fifty. Shall I drink the blood of these men? He's got a glass of water in his hand, <laughs> and he pours it out, and he's talking about drinking the blood of the men here that went out to get the water. I get they maybe they had to fight their way through. Maybe they shed some blood. Maybe they got cut. You know. Psalms 50 and uh, 13. Hey, David, we got this water for you. <laughs> we almost died doing it. And then he pours it out. Oh, man. And then uh, what's this here? Uh, this is God speaking, I guess. Um, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon the thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field. They are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. So he's going to say, I can tell you nothing. Do you want me to eat that flesh? So, and we know it's prohibited. And you can go to a lot of places where it's prohibited. So, you know, it, most of this stuff has to be metaphorical. And because uh, we can't. Genesis uh, 9 and 4, he says, uh, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. At the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. And where's life? Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So you can't shed blood 
Uh, Leviticus 7. Uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Leviticus 7. 7, 26 and 27. 26 and 27. More always you, you shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or a beast in any of your dwellings. Whosoever shall uh, it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from the people. So cutting off is a, is a serious thing. Man. Uh, Levit Leviticus 17, 17, 10, 17, 10. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood and will cut him off from all the people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood and I will give it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And he, we were bought with a price or what? He shed his blood for us. Uh, there, therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, no soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourneth among you eat blood. So, and whatsoever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For the life of all the flesh the blood, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore, I said unto the children of Israel, you shall eat the blood of no matter of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood whereof, whosoever eateth it shall be cut off. And then uh, Leviticus 19. Uh, has something else in the notes here, but... I forget what this means. Leviticus 19 and 26. Uh, I got a few verses to go with this here. 19 and 26. You shall not eat anything with blood, neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. All right. And that he's coupling this with the, the idol worship. And you can see that in the Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. So it's not, it's bad enough that you drinking blood, eating blood. Uh, you're doing enchantments uh, 25 and 26. So he couples the blood with the uh, wherefore uh, saith unto them, thus saith the Lord, you shall uh, ye eat with the blood and lift up your eyes towards your idols and shed blood that you shall possess the land. And you, you could look up all of these things about uh, these these nations that were around them, what they did with the blood. They thought that drinking the blood would make them stronger. And they, they offered it to the idols and did all kinds of crazy stuff with the blood. But they were drinking it and they were eating it because they, they wanted to become uh, one with, with whatever they were doing. And then um, 1 Corinthians goes with this too. 1 Corinthians... First Corinthians 10, 20 and 21. 20 and 21. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellows with, with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. So yeah, you eat my flesh and drink my blood. That's me. Yeah. You got to do that, and it's uh, it's symbolical. And then the last one here is First Samuel fourteen twenty three. First Samuel fourteen twenty three. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over to Bethlehem. Uh, 14 is wrong. 1432. I'm going dyslexic again. Uh, and and um, let me see. 31. They, and they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. And the people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground. And the people did eat them with the blood. And that's a no no. 
And then they told Saul, and Saul said, Behold, the people sin against the Lord, in that you eat with the blood, and have said, and he said, You have transgressed, roll a great stone unto me this day. And Saul said, Disperse among yourselves the people, and say unto them, Bring me hither every man his ox. So he had to do an atonement for the people. And Saul built an altar unto the Lord. The same was the first altar that he built unto God. And uh, it doesn't matter anyway. So eat, eat. We, we did a lot of eating, eating, eating flesh and drinking blood. And what else do I have here? Nothing really. Uh, Revelation 28 9, we see Gog and Magog get together to battle with the beloved city. Uh, and fire came out from heaven and destroyed them. All right, so we can see the, this also in Ezekiel 38, 39. Uh, and I have this one word here that I looked up. I, I can drive you crazy with all this other stuff that I got, but um, 6908. Like, oh, 6908. And this is gather. Gather together. Um, gather together. Okay, when I was doing uh, 38 and 8, I saw this gather together, and I just thought I'd look it up. Ezekiel 38 and 8. Uh, After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come to the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. Uh, against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely there. I just wanted to get that gathered together here, gathered to assemble, to collect. And um, let me look at some of these other things that I have here. Uh, that's the 20 here. That's this here. We got that. Um, the great day, we saw that. Let me go through these here. Like I said, um, that's the Gog and Magog. Uh, saw thrones, that's them. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, Some of yourself together. We read that. We read those. Okay. And this is that. And we read that, and all I got left is this, and this is a two-week study here, going through all of these, talking about Gog uh, and Magog. All right, we can see that. Uh, we read a lot of this stuff, so we understand what this is all talking about. But these are all the different uh, uh, research books that have these these names in it, and Gog and Magog, we saw. Armageddon, we saw uh, the Hebrew name of the place where the kings of the earth of the whole world would be gathered together to make war against the Lord, uh, Jesus, and the great day of Almighty God, Revelation 16, 16, we read that, and uh, Dictionary of Theology, we all talk about basically the same thing here, uh, Armageddon, Armageddon, Mountain of Megiddo, and it's a uh, it's a place where there's going to be uh, and where there was there have been slaughters and there will be slaughters there in the future. Armageddon, Har, Megiddo. You know, Har means mountain. And then then you got Megiddo here, <laughs> place of troops. Originally one of the royal cities of the Canaanites, Joshua twelve twenty one, belonged to the tribe of Manasseh, Judges one twenty seven but does not seem to have been fully occupied by the Israelites till the time of Solomon. Uh, the valley or plain of Megiddo was part of the plain of Esdraelon, the great battlefield of Palestine. It is here that Barak gained notable victory over Jabin. We saw that, the king of Hazor, whose general Sisera led the hostile enemy. We know what happened to him. He's got that nail put through his head by what's the name, uh, JL or something. Barak rallied the warriors, right? And it shows you the places that, that where there was the slaughter. Okay, and then the Pharaoh Nico uh, kills uh, King Josiah there, all right? And then also uh, Saul was also killed here. Saul and uh, the other guy, what's his name? I can't think of it right now. 
So uh, Megiddo has been identified with the modern El Jeun at the head of the Kishan under the northeastern brow of Carmel on the southwestern edge of the plain of Esdraelon, about nine miles west of Jezreel. So all these places are connected, all in that valley. Others identified it with the Mujeras, four miles southwest of Bashian, but the question of its site is still undetermined. Uh, this is all the place where it's mentioned. All the places uh, where it's mentioned, um, uh, sitting on the plain of Australia, the conquest of by Joshua, walked by Solomon, uh, prophecy concerning Josiah killed by Pharaoh Nico. We read that the valley of Deborah defeats Sisera. Okay, uh, Ahaziah dies over there. I didn't see that one. Ahaziah dies. Second Kings nine twenty seven. Uh, but when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house, and Jehu followed after him and said, smite him in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by Ebliam, and he fled to Megiddo, and he died there. And the prophecy concerning it in Zechariah 12 and 1, uh, in that day there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hararimon in the valley of Megiddo. So, and then Esdraelon, you see that that's the equivalent with Jezreel. From the Hebrew word Jezreel, the great plain. Uh, and it probably tell you the same thing about the battles and everything that was there. Uh, it had been a chosen place for encampment in every contest carried out on this country. From the days of Nebuchadnezzar, kings of Assyrians, uh, and the history of whose wars with Arphaxad, it is mentioned as the Great Plain of Esdraelon until the disastrous march of Napoleon Bonaparte from Egypt into Syria. Jews, Gentiles, Saracens, Crusaders, Frenchmen, Egyptians, Persians, Druze, Turks, and Arabs, warriors of every nation which is on heaven, have pitched their tents in the plain and have beheld the various banners of the nations wet with the dews of Tabar and Hermon. Those are the mountains over there. So everybody, <laughs> and it's going to be uh, a future battle also. Jezreel. And that's where, what's it, they, they, they killed, uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, the, the, where he says, I will, you will drink the blood of, uh, What's her name? She was killed because she shed the blood of that guy in his land. I forget. I can't think of his name. Um, uh, Jezebel. That's it. Jezebel. Uh, city uh, in Issachar, the abode of Ahab and Jezebel, the prince, and the prince really connected with their history. It was the scene of Jezebel's tragic end where they drank the blood, licked up the blood in the chariot, uh, and also uh, where her tragic end was. Can't read all of this. Uh, let's see, first, second king, Jehu. So all of these verses will tell you about this place here. Uh, where's the one with uh, Jezreel? And Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab and Jezreel, and all his great men and his kinsfolks and his priests, until he left none remaining. Jehu, the zeal of Jehu, and even he didn't take all of the high places out. So <laughs> these guys still left the high places. So, and then, like I said, we can we can go through all of these here and read about this stuff. It means scatter seed to sow, and there's going to be a lot of scattering of seed there, boy. Let me tell you. And so that's that, and we read this. We read that, and who needs that? We read these, we read this, we read that, and here we are. Here we are. Whew. That's enough for tonight, I guess. God, thank you. I mean, uh, two words, Gog and Magog, and it takes us all over the place, and we thank you. We love you for this information that you give us, and uh, we thank God for allowing uh, me to study here 
and to pass this study on. And uh, if we get anything out of it, fine. I think it opens up some stuff for me in my head about uh, what you want from us and how great and how terrible you are. And uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of uh, wisdom. And we got to depart from evil, and that's understanding. So if we if we want a wisdom and understanding, we got to repent. <laughs> Simple as that. And uh, hopefully uh, with your help, we could do that. We love you. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. What's that? Short one today. Thank you, God, for everything. <laughs>